Gail Miller, owner of the Larry H. Miller Group of Companies, thank you so much for being part of Three Questions today. My pleasure. You've remarried since oh. your husband's death, and this is a new chapter in your life. Tell us a little bit about that. I am remarried to a very fine man. He's an attorney for Snow Christensen and Martineau, the, one of the, I think it's the oldest firm in Salt Lake. He and I lived in the same neighborhood for 15 years, so he knew Larry, I knew his wife. We were acquainted through the ward, and I didn't, I, we talked yesterday about when did we really meet? We don't know if we ever officially met, but we had interaction through church callings and neighborhood events. And, after his wife died, which was about a year and a half after Larry passed away, he felt he needed to find out what his life was going to be like, so he asked me out. And I'm sure I was one of many, <laughs> but he asked me out and we began dating. And a year later, we were married. This has to be a very large family now. Together, we have nine children. We have 41 grandchildren and 14 great-grandchildren. Wow. So not as big as yours, but... <laughs> well, that's a good start. It's a good that's start. That's a very good start. Your late husband was a very driven man. I mean, there's a whole book written about that. Very much so. What was it like being married to him? Well, I often referred to it as being like a roller coaster because there were so many ups and downs and adventures. Every day was a new adventure. And sometimes they were good and sometimes they weren't. But we were a good partnership, so being married was, it was a lot of things, but as he used to say, being around here can be a lot of things, but it's never boring. And that's what marriage was like. Now, you were a full partner with him in many of his biz business dealings. Um, tell us about that relationship. How, how did that work? I mean, uh, we read about him coming home and debriefing you and that kind of thing. Tell us more about that. Well, he had the attitude that women needed to be, the wife needed to be involved in everything the husband did. And so at the very beginning, we were full partners. At that time, it was what they called JTROS, with joint rights of survivorship if the other one should die, so that didn't have to go through probate or anything. I would just become, or he would just become the full owner. Later on, we divided it so that we could do some estate planning, so he, it was divided into two, so we each had part of the the whole. But we were always full partners with each other in marriage, in work, in family, and everything we did. Now, that doesn't mean that responsibilities were divided down the middle. It just means that he had certain things that he oversaw, and I had things that I oversaw, but we worked together as partners. Over the years, he included you in just about all of the business dealings, both you and your sons were coming through. Uh, he anticipated, it seemed like, that you and the sons were going to have to take over in his absence. Is that something that you did willingly after he died? You're right in that he prepared for that. About a year and a half before he had his heart attack, he wanted us all to be in a setting where he could teach us what he thought we needed to know if he wasn't there. And he was, it was because he was a planner and a visionary. It wasn't because he saw some evil foreboding or some, something happening, but he called us all together and gave us notebooks and said, you're going to want to take notes because I'm going to feed you everything you need to know in the event that I'm not here or whenever you take over. So we spent a year and a half at that talking about how the businesses were run, who the, who the important people were, how to do things in his absence. In fact, I remember one day he said, okay, today's lesson is pretend I died yesterday. What is your first call today? Who do you contact? How do you move forward? So he even went that far to prepare us for the eventuality of his leaving us. Um, of course, he talked like that for a long, long time, so we didn't really give it maybe the due attention that we should have, but it, it did come in handy in that we were, we were not left without direction. Do you feel like you were prepared at the point he finally left us? Were you prepared to take over the empire? Well, I didn't have to do that. The thing was, he, he he promoted Greg, our oldest son, to CEO about a year, let's see, it was in July 
the year before he had his heart attack in June, so almost 11 months, and then he was sick for another eight. So about a year and a half that Greg ran the company before Larry passed away. And that was deliberately done so that Greg could get his feet on the ground to get the support of all of the top management and understand that he was the person to go to in Larry's absence, whether it was retirement or whatever. So that happened long before Larry passed away. What, what I didn't really get my fingers around was what would be my role. He asked me to stay involved, to be a bridge to the boys, because I had a lot of institutional knowledge from all of the years of downloading that he did with me. He said, I need you to stay involved for, for as long as you feel comfortable and be a bridge to the boys. And then if you want to step out, that's fine. Well, what happened was I became a bridge, and then I became involved because I didn't get the information from Greg that I got from Larry, so I started going to work. But I, again, I didn't realize what my role was going to be until much later. But I did say, I did know enough to know that it was a legacy that couldn't just end. So at the press conference where we talked about Larry's death, I said, we will continue this legacy as long as I'm alive. And that came out instinctively, that I just knew that we had something really great and we needed to continue not just for us, but for all of the people we employed, which at that time was a little over 5,000 employees. Wow. Today, today. today it's almost 12. Wow. <laughs> How has the company changed since his passing? It's changed a lot, actually. And it, it, before he got really sick, he started talking about the change from an, an entrepreneurship to a traditionally run company. And he knew that we were big enough that it could no longer be run like an entrepreneurship, even though that's where his heart was and that's what he was best at. And I think entrepreneurs like to create, and that's what he loved to do best, and that's how things got as big as they got. But he knew that one, when he was gone, there would be nobody that could replace the way he did things. So he said, I know that Greg will run it differently, and that's okay because it needs to be run like a traditional business. However, that's really hard for my boys to step away from the way Larry did things and go into a corporate governance like I've instigated or created. Yeah. They're having, I'd say they're having a little, they understand the need for it, but it's still hard for them. There are people who will say, oh, the Miller family, they are so lucky. They have all those businesses and all that money, and they are who they are. How much did luck play a role in building this empire? Well, I think Larry always thought that you make your luck. The, the lucky people are the ones that work really hard at <laughs> what they do. I think there were things that maybe happened at the right time in the right way for us, but I think by and large it was just plain hard work and dedication. And, and that's what wore Larry out. Yeah, yeah 90 hours a week was a average for him. Yeah, right? for a long time. Was it worth the price that he paid? Not to me, and in the end, not to him. He talked about how he would have done things differently, and he, he agreed that everything important would have gotten done. So I think if there's any message that he gave at the end, it was don't, ne no, don't neglect the things that are really important for things that are not so important because there's always somebody to pick up the slack, somebody to do what needs to be done. He was gone a lot. He was. Yeah. Yeah. Had Larry H. Miller not done the things that he did 90 hours a week, average and building this empire and working incessantly for going vacations, all of that kind of thing. Had he not done that, the asset that he left behind in the form of the Utah Jazz and the dealerships and the fan stores and the other businesses would not even exist. Maybe. Maybe they would. <laughs> I think he could have taken better care of himself. And I think that's one message I would like to give anybody who works incessantly, that you can work a whole lot longer if you're healthy. He could have had 20 more years if he had taken care of his health. 
his children would he would have had better relationships with them as it was it took until they came into the business to work with him that they ever really got to know him and then it was just that part of life so he missed out a lot there and they did too um, I think he would have he would have had a, a more enjoyable life although I don't I'm not saying that his life was not enjoy, unenjoyable. He had hobbies and talents that he pursued. So even, you know, he played softball for a long time. Yeah, the elbow, we know yeah, the elbow, yeah. yeah. And he, he loved music. He would create CDs for, like, he did all kinds of CDs for me and he'd call them Larry to Gail, rock, rock and roll, easy listening, you know. So he, he did a lot of things that helped to, to even out his life but they were done in those moments when he wasn't concentrating on work. Yeah. Forbes magazine says that almost two-thirds of the world's billionaires started from scratch. Now you yourself started from very modest means. What is it about poverty that creates billionaires? If I could say it's one thing, I think it is the fact that they're not afraid of losing it all because they know what it's like not to have anything. And that makes it easier to face risk and challenge and, and things like that. And I think they have to work harder as people. I know for me, coming up in a poor family, I learned an awful lot of things about living life that I would never have learned otherwise things like how to create uh, something out of nothing, you know, how to use what I have to, th to the best of my advantage. You used to make your own clothes. Oh, I, used, I made my own clothes, I cut my own hair. In fact, I cut Larry's hair until he died. Really? <laughs> I always cut his hair and I cut my boy's hair until they decided they didn't like it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but it, uh, you just learn to do the things you need to do. And I think that's what causes people who go on to become wealthy to not worry so much because they know they can do it both ways. Well, and they've lived without it before. Right. So that, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> John Huntsman Sr. described himself and your late husband as two riverboat gamblers. <laughs> what evidence did you see that that description is correct? Well, I don't know so much about John, only what I've read in his book and, and through conversations we've had. But for Larry, he, he, was, he was not risk averse. He was very self-confident. And he did things for what he thought was the right reason, not to please anyone else and not to make an impression on anyone else. And so I think that's kind of a riverboat gambling attitude, you know? You, you live your life according to your own conscience and do things the way you think they should be done and take the risk. Was Larry a spiritual man? He was. There was a period in our lives where neither one of us were very active, but then we, we became reactivated in the church. And in fact, we moved from Colorado to Utah in 1979, the same year the jazz did. And in 1980, 15 years after our wedding, we were sealed in the temple with our family. So it took a lot of years to get us to that point, but there were some very um, patient people in Colorado that took us on as a project and did a lot of good work. Good project. Yeah. <laughs> the new legacy trust that you announced in January ensures that the Utah Jazz, its ownership and its location will remain right here in Utah in the Miller family. Tell us how that trust works. Well, it works as if it's the owner of the Utah Jazz and it has a trustee and it has a board of managers and the uh, object is to manage the Jazz and the arena and possibly other assets as we go forward that we may put in there. Uh, so that they will remain in, in Utah in perpetuity because this is our home, this is where we live, this is, we love this state. And so we felt like what better way can we take away the fears that the Jazz are going to leave than say it's here permanently. I mean people 
hear us say all the time, we're not selling the jazz, but for some reason they just could not believe that a person could say they wouldn't sell something worth that much money and take the money and run. It isn't about the money. It's about the asset for this state and what it means to the state of Utah and to the people here. It's a unifier. Very interesting to see the empire, including the jazz, the dealerships, the fan stores, and the multiple other uh, enterprises that make up this Larry H. Miller group of companies. If you had to identify the purpose of this empire, what would it be? I think it has several. I think in the beginning it was a way for us to feed and clothe our family and some security under our own control. We started with one dealership with 30 employees and felt like that was enough to keep us, you know, secure. But then as doors began to open, um, we found that we could take on more, create more jobs, have a bigger imprint in the communities for good. So I think the purpose now of our businesses is to enrich lives, to be able to do things that make the communities where we do business better because we're there. We want to be the best place in town to work and the best place in town to do business. And we work very hard at those two things. We have great employees. We have people who uh, can send their children to college because we provide scholarships for our dependent children of our employees who've been with us two years. We, we're able to do a lot of philanthropic things now after many years of putting all the money back into the business to make it strong. We're now able to take some of those profits out and do things for the community, for each community. And we do business in about 45 states. So it, it, it makes a big impact. Yeah. What else? You, you were going to go on. I, I well, feel I, like you were going to go I, on. I just think it's, it's to be an example to others for doing the right thing for the right reason. Now that the Legacy Trust is in place, is the Utah Jazz going to bring home an NBA championship? You know, we have made so many improvements in how we do things in the Utah Jazz and, and put, put in place a lot of the pieces that we think will get us there. And we've given them that charge. I mean, before it's always been, well, if we get one, it'll be great. and We'll work hard and we'll bring in, you know, we hope we do. But we really now are intentionally saying we want a championship and letting them do what it takes to put the pieces in place that will bring home a championship. The problem is once you get to the top, then there's nowhere to go but down, so you have to, it gets even harder. Yeah, it, it's hard to determine what's more difficult, becoming number one or staying number one. I think it's staying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so what kinds of things does the trust do to bring about this championship that you are seeking? Well, it puts in place players that are needed. We, we manage the money and we started about four, maybe five years ago with saying, okay, we have a choice here. We can scrape it all, start at the bottom and build what we want. And it's going to be very difficult because there are going to be some rough years we go through, which has happened. But we very systematically controlled the money and the contracts to be able to get players that will give us the talent that we need to, to have a championship team. And, and I think we've been pretty successful at that. doesn't mean we're there or that we've got everybody we need, but we're on our way. We've created facilities for them to practice at and to have the equipment that they need and the latest technology for measuring their strength and their ability. We have, we have a relationship with the University of Utah Medical Center that handles all of our medical needs with the team, um, which is very important. We have a staff of coaches that are young and progressive and, and that Quinn has chosen that support him. And we've given him full run of what he needs to bring this team to a championship. So I think the things we've put in place have given latitude to those who are working toward that championship. And of course, Dennis Lindsay is a great a big part of that and a very good part of that. Did Michael Jordan really push off? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Put 
putting all other personalities and characteristics aside, is it a good idea to put a billionaire in the White House? Boy, I don't normally get into politics. <laughs> I think it's good to put a businessman into the White House. I think government became so one-sided with politicians. They lost touch with reality and what businesses need to be successful. I think they made so many regulations that stifled business growth. I think they handcuffed people from being able to do. I think they affected business, education, uh, many other things that, that probably I not as close to, but banking. The things that, that affect me, I think it's made business really hard. So I think to have a businessman in the White House, if he's not too radical, will bring things back the other way and help businesses to grow and prosper and help our, our country to grow. And like most things, to make a big difference hurts for a while and then you go on and grow and build and get a stronger foundation. So I'm hopeful that whether he's a billionaire or not, the fact that he's a businessman will be good. Your family built what is now Vivint Smart Home Arena. It was the Delta Center back in the day. In 1991, it cost $93 million to was build. It, was it that much? Yeah, it was $93 <laughs> million. Well, and now, today as we record this, a $125 million renovation project is going to get underway March 20th. Right. Tell us about this project and what brought it about. We are either the oldest or the second oldest arena in the league, which is amazing after 25 years. And many arenas are they are better because they're updated. They have better clubs, better services, better food. Our bowl is good. We built the arena for basketball, so the bones of our arena are really good. And the people that came in to give us an opinion on construction or re reconstruction said, you really don't have to do a lot because the, the arena was built so well in the beginning and the sight lines are good. What we need to do is a cosmetic update. Now, tell me why that would cost $125 million, <laughs> but it will. And we've been very careful about costs. But what it will do, it will bring an excitement to the arena that, that is new and fresh and reaches the younger generations and, and gives people a, a, an experience that is updated and fresh and exciting. And I, I think it, on top of all of that, it says to our players, we're here for you. We are going to give you what you need to do what you need to do to get a championship. Yeah. So the, the locker room will have a whole new look. So, so I, I guess it's safe to say that the Legacy Trust and this renovation project kind of go hand in hand in kind of a rebirth of the Utah Jazz. Well, you could say that. I, I'm, I'm not sure it wouldn't have happened without the trust. I'm sure it would have happened without the trust. We would still do the renovation. What this does is puts it in a package where there's a little more control about the money and where it comes from and how much there is and how it's managed. So it, it's a good thing. As, an, as the owner of an NBA franchise, when do you think Utah will be ready for an NFL franchise? Wow. I, I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that. I think an NFL franchise needs so much more money than an NBA franchise, that it may be really hard to have one in Utah. It's hard enough for the NBA to be here. And that's why we bought the team in the first place. If we lost it, if it left Utah, it probably would never come back because there are so many big markets that want the NBA franchise and there are only 30 of them. So to get it back would have been very difficult, if not impossible. So getting a, something that costs even more than the NBA franchise. I don't know if we have the infrastructure or the following to support a football team. As we wrap up, let me just ask you one last question, and that is this. Looking back over your life, would you do anything differently than what you have done? <laughs> oh, I would do a lot of things differently, but I would hope I'd get to the same conclusion. I would just do them better. 
I think there's always room for improvement. I don't have I don't have regrets, but I think I could have done a lot of things a lot better. What kinds of things? Um, I could have insisted my husband be home more. I think that would have been better for all of us. I think I could have been more fun as a mother. I think I, I was too concerned with um, cooking, cleaning, and yard work instead of raising the kids. Although I, I hope they have good memories. So I, I think they're all just personal things that you know always are your own worst critic. Gail Miller, owner of the Larry H. Miller Group of Companies, thank you so much for thank being part you. of Three Questions. It's been a pleasure, Bob. Nice to be here.